Hello and welcome back. So what I want to talk to you about today is bipolar transistors and in particular how to use them as switches in digital electronic circuits. Now as soon as transistors were invented people started using them in digital circuits because of their clear superiority compared to vacuum tubes. I mean they're much smaller and they use way less current. But if you try to switch a transistor on usually there's no problem. But once you try to turn it off then you start to run into certain issues. I mean only if you're trying to do this very fast. So if you're curious about what I'm on about and why this is happening and more importantly how to fix it then keep watching. So to start things off I got this little experiment going on. So what I got here is a signal coming from a signal generator. We can see it here on the first channel of the oscilloscope which is driving a transistor that's being used as a switch and it's switching a signal through a 200 ohm resistor and the voltage between the collector of the transistor and the ground I'm monitoring through the second channel of the oscilloscope. And as a test transistor I'm using the BC141 which is not a bad transistor. I mean it has a transition frequency of 50 megahertz so it should be pretty fast. Now at the moment I'm using a 1 kilohertz square wave and we can see that it's working well as expected. I mean we have the input signal, the output signal, they're in phase opposition as we would expect it to be and we can see that the duty cycle of the two signals is almost identical. So if you're using this thing at 1 kilohertz no issue with it. But if I turn up the frequency a bit Say we go to 50 kilohertz and we just overlap the two signals, we start to see an issue going on. We can see that when the input signal turns high, the transistor is turned on, so the output signal falls to ground and it's working almost in instantaneously. But when we're trying to switch the transistor off, so we see that the input signal goes low, we see that there's quite a big delay until the transistor is reacting. I mean this is obvious at 50 kilohertz but if we go even higher so let's say 200 kilohertz the transistor is barely switching off so it stays on almost all of the time. And if I would increase the frequency a bit higher say go to 500 kilohertz then the transistor no longer switches off. So it stays on all the time regardless of the input signal. Now this is not a bad transistor but the way it, in which it behaves will be based on the way in which it's being used. So what I want to look at today is some methods to improve its switching characteristics. But first of all let's understand what we're seeing and why it's behaving this way. And then we can see how we can make things better. So when measuring transistor switching characteristics usually you have a standard test setup. So something like this in which you insert a signal into the base of the transistor and then you're measuring the output signal in the collector. Now depending on the transistor and how they measured it you might have some other components in the base so maybe a diode to ground or maybe a different potential driving the base but this is the core circuit. So when we measure this we're going to get a couple waveforms. So we have our input signal and we have our output signal and there's two timings we're interested in. The on time, the time it takes the transistor to enter conduction and the off time, the time it takes the transistor to exit conduction. And now for the on time there's two time intervals in which we're interested in. First is the delay time, so the time it takes between when your input signal reaches 10% and when your output signal reaches 90%, so the time it takes the transistor to react. And then your rise time, which in this case is the falling time, in which your output signal drops between 90 and 10 percent. And then when we talk about the off time again we have a storage time so the time it takes the transistor to react to the falling input signal and then we have a fall time which is a rise time again the time it takes the transistor to actually fully turn off. Now the rise and the fall times I guess are swapped because normally you use them to express currents. But for me it was much easier to show and measure voltages. But the point is that 
Whenever you're talking about on time, there's a rise time involved, and when you're talking about off time, there's a fall time involved, regardless of the type of transistor. Now, if we look at the actual values from some data sheets, so what I got here is the 2N222, our BC141 that we're testing today, and an MJE13009. And what you can see is that the switching timings vary from tens of nanoseconds to thousands of nanoseconds. So you have fast transistors and you have really slow transistors. And in almost all cases, the off time is much bigger than the on time. Now, depending on the datasheet, you might have all four of these timings, or you, you might just have the on time and the off time, as is the case for the BC141. But regardless, the biggest contributor, so the timing that takes the highest amount of time, is this storage time. Basically, this has to do with the way in which the bipolar transistor works. So to get it to turn on, you need a signal in the base, and that will lead to charges traveling between the base and the emitter. And when you're using the transistor as a switch, usually you'll be saturating it. So you will be using more charges than is actually needed to get current flowing through the collector and the emitter. And the storage time refers to the time needed to remove all those extra charges that have built up in the base. So if you're using the transistor in a saturated mode, then the switching timings will be quite affected. So to get the transistor to switch faster, you have two options, either to get some sort of way to extract the charges faster or to prevent them from building up in the first place. So let's look at some circuit implementations that can achieve these goals. So what I got here is a basic circuit in which I'm using a BC817 transistor. I didn't use the 141 because I couldn't really find a good model for it, but for this transistor I got a proper model from the NXP website. So if we run this thing and we compare our input signal to the output signal, we see that the turning on behavior is almost ideal but we have a very large gap in the turning off part. So we can clearly see this storage delay time. Now, as I said, one of the things that you could try to do is try to extract the charges from the base faster. And you might think that one way to do that is by increasing the base current. So what I got here is the exact same circuit, only difference being that the base resistor is now 10 times smaller, 100 ohms. That means that the base current is also almost 10 times larger. And if we check the response of this circuit, it's even worse. So we can see that the storage time is even larger. So this implementation with the increased base current has an even slower turn off time. Problem behind this being that when you reduce the base resistor and increase the current, you are extracting charges faster, but there's way more charges to extract because you're driving the transistor even harder. But there is a middle ground. And it can be achieved with a circuit that looks something like this. So I kept my 1 kilo ohm of series resistance, but I split it up into two pieces. And one piece, the 900 ohm resistor, is shunted by a capacitor. The point of this being that when you drive the base this time, you're not driving it with a constant current, but rather you have a large current when you have a transition, and then you have a small current when you're keeping the transistor on or off. So you can clearly see these nice spikes going on when the input voltage is transitioning. So during the transition, current is going through the 100 ohm resistor and the 10 nanofarad capacitor, but afterwards, current is going through the series 900 ohm resistor, so there's not that many charges that need to be extracted. So now if we compare this to our reference circuit response, we can see that we have a much better response. There's not that many charges that need to be extracted, but we have a higher current to extract them with. But the circuit is still not fast enough. And the next best thing that you can do is prevent all that charge buildup in the base. Basically, you need to prevent the transistor from saturating. Now, you could try with various resistor values and so on, but the downside of that is that Circuit will not be that stable, especially with temperature and parametric dispersion. But another way to prevent saturation is by implementing a feedback loop. So some sort of mechanism that 
verifies the collector emitter voltage, prevents it from going too low, and acts on the base. And historically, the first implementation of this sort of circuit is the Baker clamp. So a circuit that looks something like this. Now I kept my capacitor resistor fix in here, but the Baker clamp itself is the part built with the diodes. So the logic behind this circuit is that when you drive the transistor, there's about a 0.7 volt drop on the base emitter. By adding an extra diode in series, you need a total voltage of 1.4 volts to drive the transistor, so 0.7 from the diode, 0.7 from the base emitter. And by connecting this extra diode between the input signal and the collector, in case the collector emitter voltage would go too low, all of the input signal would go through the upper diode and prevent any signal going into the base. So this feedback loop works by stabilizing the transistor in a way that the collector emitter voltage is roughly the same as the base emitter voltage, therefore preventing it from going into saturation. And for this circuit, well, we can go to a much, much faster input signal. So what I got here is a signal that has a period of four microseconds rather than 400 as with the previous circuit. But even so, if we look at the output, we see that this time the transistor is switching almost instantaneously. So because the transistor no longer goes into saturation, it's much, much easier to turn the transistor on and turn the transistor off. The only downside of this circuit being that the collector emitter voltage is now about 0.7 volts. So because the transistor is not saturating, you have a much, much higher collector emitter voltage. Now, this is quite a complicated circuit. You need like at least three diodes, and depending on the application, you might have also some extra resistors, some capacitors here and there. So it's quite a complicated circuit. So how would you build this thing in a simpler way? Well, we can still apply the same principle. So to have some sort of feedback mechanism between the collector and the driving signal, something that would limit the collector emitter voltage. And we can do that by using some different type of diodes. Now with the normal PN junction diode, the voltage drop on it is almost 0.7, so the same as for the base emitter voltage. But we have some other diodes to play around with. Historically, the first thing that was used was the germanium PN junction diode, which has a special property of having a forward voltage of around 0.4. And later, engineers turned to the Schottky diode, which is a silicon diode, but with the same roughly 0.4 forward voltage drop. And the way in which you would use that is this sort of circuit. So I removed the two diodes in the base of the transistor and added a single Schottky diode between the base and the collector. And basically we can do the same thing as with the Baker clamp. The difference being that this time the collector emitter voltage will be slightly smaller, but we will still prevent saturation. So since the forward voltage drop on the Schottky diode is around 0.4, we can have a collector emitter voltage drop of around 0.3 this time. More than the 0.1 that you would get in saturation, but less than the 0.7 that you get with the Baker clamp. And by using this arrangement, we get switching times roughly identical to the Baker clamp, but we have a collector emitter voltage that is lower. And another advantage of this sort of implementation is that this can be done very easily on the silicon chip. So in certain integrated circuits, rather than using standard bipolar transistors, they are using Schottky transistors, which is a bipolar transistor with this extra Schottky diode on top. So let's see this sort of circuits in practice. See if we can improve the response of my BC141 transistor. So to start things off, let's just quickly look at the original circuit. So what I got here is the transistor with just a one kilo ohm resistor in the base. And we can see that we have a 2.16 microsecond delay between when the input signal falls and the output signal rises. So the first thing to try out is to use a split resistor and add the extra capacitor. And by doing this, we've reduced the delay time to roughly 400 nanoseconds. So it's much, much better. But now let's see what the effect of an extra Schottky diode will do to the switching characteristics. So now we see that we have almost no delay. So we've, we're down to 30 nanoseconds. Let's just zoom in to see if that's actually true. So I also cranked up the frequency to two megahertz. So 10 times the frequency that we were previously using. 
So now we can see that the switching action is much, much faster. So the oscilloscope is measuring 40 nanoseconds, and we can see that we have roughly the same delay when the input signal turns high and the output goes low. So the turn on delay is similar to the turn off delay. So by making these small modifications to the circuit, we can have switching times much, much faster than what you would get in the datasheet. So we went from the 200 and 800 nanoseconds from the datasheet down to less than 100 nanoseconds of switching times. Now, depending on the application, you might use the Baker clamp or the Schottky transistor implementation. Most often, Schottky transistors will be found in integrated circuits or low power devices, and the Baker clamp is more used with higher power transistors, where you want the transistor to be as far away from saturation as possible to get it to switch faster. So all in all, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos and see you next time. Bye bye.